effect of open and the issue of open access is something which we learned recently over the last 10, 15 years how important this is. And for certain disciplines, let's call about mathematics for example, where they have to spend for their publications sometimes 50% of their research money. This is of course an enormous burden and we have to talk about this issue. It's different in my faculty in medicine, for example, here the proportion is of course much lower because we get more research money. And I think where we have not yet started really to understand the benefits of open access is in fact in the humanities. Here I think we have a long way still to go, but we have to start today if we want to be there in a couple of years. So I think it's of utmost importance. If we are looking um, at the daily uh, experience so far, um, the students, but also uh, faculty members, what is the attitude at the moment? And talking about, and you are now the chair of the Federation, yeah. and I should have uh, congratulate you with that appointment. You have an overview. What is the feeling of the students and what is the feeling of uh, faculty members? I think it's still a big difference. Um, for example, in medicine, the students don't care so much about the issue. It's different in natural sciences, I think, and it is not an issue, I don't think, in the humanities. Professors, on the other side, the faculty, they are very concerned in natural sciences, and they really protest uh, and try to get their rights back from the publishers. Uh, in medicine, for example, in biomedicine, we still don't know what we estimate more, the free access or the prestige of the journals. And in humanities, there is still an enormous fear that, um, uh, that this movement will disturb their rights and their individuality when they talk to the publishers and things like that. So it is very, very different in disciplines. And probably the outcome will be that we must find solutions according to the different needs of the disciplines. It's not only stubbornness. It's probably more kind of how do we understand our job? How do we understand our publication? How do we understand what belongs really to us? And therefore, I'm looking forward because we learned a lot over the last years and we are continuing to learn. I'm very confident that we will make it. For the European Commission, and uh, for me as uh, the Commissioner for the Digital Agenda, and also um, responsible for quite a bit of um, money to spend in research and innovation, um, <coughs> it is always a point how can I explain to the taxpayer, so to say the European citizens in the street, why we are spending the money, how we are spending the money, and what is in for them. And there is a good story. What would you explain to the European taxpayer what is at stake? First of all, I believe that intellectual ownership is as important as material ownership. Um, and therefore we have to protect this intellectual ownership and at the same time allow access for the researchers to get rapid access to what they need. And one has to admit that in many research areas, paper reading is decaying, is going down, whilst the usage of internet is, is getting more and more the normal issue. Or for example, some professions like journalists they have at least three desks. And how should they afford to buy the same book three or four times in order to be able to, to work at these places? So we must understand that there's a, a real need there and at the same time there are very good reasons to protect intellectual ownership. But as I said before, we have to think about this and we will find solutions. Coming back to the open access for what is stimulating in such a policy is that it could flavor a lot of next activities with that type of policy. Yeah. And what is your expectation? Is it going quicker than what we were used to? Is it... Uh, 
I'm not sure. I think it probably more disciplines will take part in open access. I think it is a movement which will not be, um, there will be not a turnaround, not at all. Um, if, if, if it will be speedier, it depends a little bit how the young generation who is now entering the research is coming in and yes, the first answer could be it will be more speedy because the young generation is dealing with those issues much much less complicated than my generation is doing that. This is probably true, but even more important is to take care of the intellectual property that should, this, this must not be lost in the core. Otherwise, if intellectual property is not respected properly, this could be an enormous drawback for this movement, which is good for science. But here we must find a, a very intelligent balance, a lot of thinking. What is your experience and what is your wish in this, uh, this movement, Europe taking the lead and combining it with your uh, requirements to yeah. say, but then you have to, uh, to organize and to regulate and to make an implementation cater in which it is secured that the intellectual property rights are guaranteed. Are we taking the lead? Do you think that um, that is yes. that we should be um, even more advanced in our uh, policy? I think academies could be of help. In the beginning of open access, for example, my academy has mm -hmm. been very instrumental and they should play this role now and on a pan-European level. I think there is, there is work to be done in order to because academies, they are probably the only ones who combine natural scientists and humanity scientists because it's the big divide between those two. And I think there is a certain responsibility. And the second responsibility is, of course, if open access and these movements are really helpful for the progress of science, then it is another interest of the academies because they are there to help the progress of science. So I think we have two motives to take care and become more involved in that system. And number three, to protect, to protect, which is probably the most prestigious intellectual property for our people, that we are caretakers for this, I think is another motive why academies should and could easily come into this game. You are a professor of medicine. Um, what will the future be of the availability of uh, data and articles on the health uh, research uh, uh, mean oh. for uh, your discipline and for your students the and for the industry, for it's yeah. all connected? The working surrounding will still change. Mm. Um, I think what is already now available that the doctor standing at the bed of the patient, he already has yeah. his ad hoc information there, and this will increase. So the newest possibilities to diagnose and to get the dif differential diagnostics where you get the help of, of IT, I think this will st keep changing. But it will also not only change our work acutely in a certain situation, we will follow the patient lifelong where you have all his data at once and you need that. If we want to have not disease management but lifelong health management, IT and the immediate availability of all this data will change the sur working surroundings. In medicine I think this is quite clear. In research in, 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 in industrial research for new pharmaceutics, for new drugs, the same is true. The same is true. Huge databases worldwide will be accessible like that. In humanities, this is a silent revolution, but it also has totally changed the working surroundings, even in, in humanities. Um, if you go for dictionaries, for example, where you had all these handwritten stuff, this is more or less gone. 
you get your information and you can interconnect different dictionaries with each other in seconds. In another world, which is also a silent revolution, we have this kind of orchid subjects. Um, science on Japan, science on Indonesia, things like that. Universities have not just one or maximum two professors. And these are huge areas. And they have been working somehow in isolation. Now, if they put all their data in, 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 in digitized form in the cloud, in the cloud mm -hmm. they have within seconds a virtual faculty where they can speak together immediately. And this has changed the attitude in humanities and is still rapidly changing. So the world, there are open or visible, visible changes, but there are also silent changes ongoing, which dramatically have, have changed and will change our working surroundings, no doubt. What is your expectation seven years from now, talking about this type of movement? I think in natural sciences, in medicine, they will individually try to do these things. Um, we will probably be on a European scale um, be able to interconnect patient data which are not connected today. You get much better information on epidemiolo uh, epidemiology and, and things like that to understand things much better. This is what I hope. In humanities I definitely hope that with some help of European bodies also humanities will take part in this creating of a more international group, working group, as I said, this virtual uh, faculty creation. They need more help and still money as compared to natural sciences and medicine. Here we have an enormous drive in the system already. Here in humanities and social sciences, where we also need huge data sets, here we need a little bit of top-down help in order to, to ensure that they do the right things. How is a academy organized a decade from now for if it is done in the virtual facu faculty approach, then you are talking about a complete different management. Yes, the, work, the working places will be different. Yeah. They will live in a virtual surrounding, yeah. number one. Um, they will have probably much better interconnection. Not we, we do this infrastructure research, long-term provision of, of data sets, but there will be a much closer interaction with the acute and, and uh, short-term research activities. We will probably have many more young people working in close connection with our infrastructure and databases. I think we will have European-wide dictionary um, communities where they work together. It's ridiculous. In certain areas, we have a German way of doing this kind of European research. We have a Dutch way, we have a French way, an Italian way. We will become a European community and we will find ways to understand much better what Europe can be and what Europe has been and what Europe should be. We have an enormous responsibility. Here I do see that European community um, and European bodies, European corporations will bring these, these topics more to a kind of explosion. So more European organization, more modern types of orientation, close interaction between the databases and modern research and, and um, advising our people better about what science can do and what science is doing. The, the ultimate goal must be to make people understand what science can and has to do. And if this knowledge gap is increasing, we will have a problem. If science is no longer allowed to do what they can do and have to do for creating a future, then we are in deep problem. And therefore academies are the place, I believe, mm. where we have to help society to understand and in some cases even politicians will ask yes. the advice. Yes. But my primary goal is that societies 
become learning societies with the help of us and with the help of internet and all those. We need all tools. It's no longer the big professor who gives a talk and then hopes that everybody understands. We need all means in order to get across what science can do and how science is enabling an interesting future. Thank you very much for this discussion. Thanks for having me.